All right, welcome to the Think Fit Be Fit podcast. This is season six, and I'm your hostess, Jennifer Schwartz. I'm sitting here with my co hostess, Angela Damolin. Hello, everyone. And I am so excited today. We have so many listeners that have heard of grounding, red light therapy, mitochondria, circadian rhythm, but just enough for you all to be like, targets of advertising, in my opinion. You really probably, most likely, you don't actually know what you're doing. And we want an in-depth conversation about these things because I'm here to learn something as well. And I'd love to, um, you know, have another guest on for this technology season. So some of our guests this season are going to be talking about specific technology. Um, and most of, you know, I love technology, um, when it comes to my health, but also I would, I'm, uh, we're having our guests today so that we can look at the complexity of our own technology, our own biology and have, um, more than just like a name to it. Like I said, like a marketing name, like we all know, like Dr. Huberman loves to like, you know, keep us so informed with all the papers he doesn't read. But um, it's better to like, you know, have a meaningful connection to these things. And like, um, I think the we have complexity, we have technology, and the more that we honor it and that we trust it, the more exalted we are as optimal, like vibrant fitness enthusiasts. Um, Hell yeah. <laughs> okay. So today's guest is a world-renowned strength coach, Rob Jacobs of Outlaw Strength. And welcome to Think Fit, Be Fit podcast. All right. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yes. Um, it's been in the works for a minute. Um, we have some, probably a multiple current, um, what do you call it, connections um, from the Poliquin world. Uh, a lot of my listeners don't know this, but I have a huge respect for Charles Poliquin and the biosignature. It has, it, it, it held my hand getting into the complexity of the body probably 15 years ago and probably honestly saved me from alcoholism. To be honest with you, I learned so much about like basic lifestyle stuff through his programming uh, or his, the biosignature programming and so much about my body. I was introduced to functional medicine through his stuff. Um, I've over the years, I've probably had five biosignature coaches. <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm I'm proxied. <laughs> uh, huge fan, huge respect for Charles Poliquin. I'm only bringing that up because Rob worked with him personally um, as a mentee in his inner circle, and I love one of your like messages that I I've heard you, um, over the year or so. And you know, that you want to carry on his legacy. And, um, so I just have a lot of respect for that. So I just want to throw that out there to start with. Thank you. I mean, I cer certainly wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Charles. So. Yeah. So this lady sitting right here doesn't know anything about that. So, and probably our audience doesn't either. Um, a lot has happened since his, um, you know, since he died. And so like, like, let's just start with, you know, where you've come up in the strength and conditioning industry. Uh, so I started back in 2000. Um, I started coaching track and field, coaching basketball. So I was the sport coach for those things and had gotten in on kind of on the ground floor of when the whole like speed development, um, sports performance craze really started in the you know mid 90s early 2000s so that was kind of how i got started just in the in the fitness field um pretty much in high school so i was i was coaching sort of uh, helping coach track and field and actually helping coach these speed development classes that i had done you know both semesters multiple <laughs> multiple times a year um, all four years of high school so i got a pretty early start my dad was a coach at the school so i knew all the coaches and and it helped that I had a bit of an aptitude for the movements. Um, so I, that's how I started there. And then eventually, once I graduated, I was hired to, to be the sports performance coach for you know all the teams at the high school, basically baseball, basketball, did some football stuff, some volleyball stuff, uh, tons of stuff there. And then progressed into uh, 
coaching PE for a little while and then formally coaching track and field, several events there, and then moved into more formal sports performance and then weightlifting and eventually got into MMA. Um, that was probably my first real foray into, into managing everything about an athlete because uh, with track and field, at first I was just actually a track and field coach. So I coached triple jump, uh, hurdles, long jump, and uh, helped out in the pole vault a little bit. So I was actually the sport coach for those things and the sport coach for basketball. So that's how I started uh, with my dad's background even. And then progressed into into MMA and then the, the training side to MMA and really sort of took off from there. And that's when I, when I found Charles in the early mid to early 2000s, I guess, um, and started incorporating all that with my with my MMA guys and incorporating that into my sports performance, speed development stuff, and then realized that speed development was a bit of a joke uh, and shifted completely to the weightlifting mm -hmm. side of things. Um, and it's sort of that would be a fun conversation. <laughs> yeah, that is a magnificent conversation. So I, I do feel like I've got a pretty decent, like well-rounded viewpoint on that because that is how I got my start. I mean, I was a it, there's merit to a lot of it, but there's also I mean, like speed ladders and some of that stuff. There's uh, no merit to to several concepts that the uh, the sport specific speed development people will <laughs> will try to try to push on everybody. So that's I don't like talking about myself. That's a long winded thing. Got in strong man. Um, Charles coached me for several years. Um, got into the inner circle somehow. Uh, I still remember getting to like my first FaceTime from him with a mouthful of food and just like dropped my fork and everything. So that was, that was pretty cool. Eventually, you know, he became a, a, a comfortable calling him a friend, even though he's not here. I don't think he'd deny that if he was in the, if he was in the room and, and really, like I said, trying to try to push his stuff forward. Cause so many people, so many of the young coaches I talked to now are still stuck on what Charles was saying in 2015 and 2016, which back then was, you know, 20 years ahead of its time, but we're pushing six, seven, eight, years down the road now. And Charles would have moved forward from that stuff. He was starting to move forward from that stuff. And the, you know, the last lectures, um, geez, two weeks before he died, one of the last lectures when he opened his fourth performance facility, I'd say it was like 90% circadian biology. It was light. It was red light. It was all these things uh, from the circadian system. And just listening to him talk, he picked up on all this stuff. And a lot of it was from uh, Chinese medicine with how he incorporated that in the strength training and a lot of the circadian aspect and the Chinese medicine clock, you know, all the stuff that they were doing thousands of years ago, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Charles brought into the fitness industry and into weightlifting and into high level mm -hmm. performance. He just, I mean, you know, in 2016, we didn't really know how, the level of control the system had, you know, but basically we knew if you get your circadian rhythms, nobody really knew what that was at the time, like in check, you'll grow more, you'll be faster, you'll be stronger, you know, you'll be all these things, but, nobody really knew the mechanism. And now we know, you know, like we, it controls everything. Like there's nothing that doesn't control. So, you know, we've all been able to function for the last 40 or 50 years with terrible circadian biology. Now mm -hmm. we're starting to understand like all these things are happening because of dysfunction, you know, uh, disrupted circadian rhythm can change 90% of the uh, genetic expression within a muscle, like within skeletal muscle. So mm -hmm. that's huge for an athlete, huge for anybody. So a lot of that little stuff that, that we're really trying to, to push forward and just not be stuck in, you know, like Charles wasn't right about everything. And he was the first one to like, Oh, geez, this is way better than that. So let's do this now, you know? And there's, there's a lot of some of those things like carbohydrates at night and all those things that we just know more now than we did before. And we got to get past all that crap so we can keep pushing forward and start to develop new theories and better theories and keep advancing. Mm. Light diets. <laughs> Uh, Angela sometimes uses the term photon diet. I like that. Are my photonutrients available? What is, or am I mal, malnourished? Yeah. I like that. Photonically. Photon yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. We almost um, are photonically closer. malnourished. Photonically deficient. Um, and, or photonically basic. <laughs> <laughs> That's our, uh, that's our hand gesture for basic. Nice. So it's, it's a, it's a nod to physical therapists that <laughs> prescribe all the external rotation ah. exercise. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> um, anyways, so, oh, okay. Where do you want to start? Well, we love first, you know, your, 
ability to respond to the current environment. You know, I think like what you're saying, a lot of people get caught up in what happened 15 years ago and we're in such a rapidly changing world, you know, speaking of technology that we've got to be able to update and refresh our own browsers according to the data in front of us. And I really appreciate your approach. That's certainly our approach as well. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit, uh, if this is a good time, to talk about the effects of radiation on circadian rhythm and sleep. Whoa, and, get in, in there. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> very curious about this because, and, and what would your mentors say? Like, what do you think? How can we best navigate this ever changing environment that um, we find ourselves in day to day? So, uh, what kind of radiation are we talking about? Yeah, like non native radiation oh, okay. from. So, there's, uh, there's a lot at play, but it, you, it, ultimately you can boil it down to a few like simple nuggets is essentially what that stuff does is it dehydrates everything in, in the mitochondria. And so to try to help understand how important that is, is, the only reason we breathe oxygen is so that a mitochondria can turn it into water so that then water can carry information and our enzymes and proteins can then do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. So if you do, if you take something that decreases the mitochondria's ability to make that, you know, matrix water that is crucial to biology, you're done. Like that's a, that's a pretty, that's a pretty bad problem. So, yeah. uh, and so one of the things that we're learning now that, you know, it takes like 20 years for, for research to really start to hit practice. Right. And one of the things we're learning now is, I mean, some people say 95% of all disease is mitochondrial in origin, which is one of the reasons we've been so unsuccessful in, you know, coming up with successful like cures for a lot of these diseases. Now the research for sure is probably between 80 and 86%. Like no one could deny that, but there's a lot of people saying it's above 90. Um, and you know, this kind of radiation, right, which is, comes from the lights you're sitting in, comes from the, the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth and the, the wireless chargers in the phone and now the electric cars and you know, all this other stuff that is, has a massive impact. And it's, it, it's interesting because it's, almost all of these like actual mechanisms of action are, are quite simplistic, but the like technical aspects of how these things happen, right? Like you, the, the electromagnetic radiation will displace calcium from certain places, right? It'll, it'll shoot it out of the mm -hmm. plasma reticulum and take it somewhere else where it's not going to do what it's meant to do. And then that changes polarity and then potassium gated ATP channels change. And like, now you're looking at like signal transductions, right? Cause that's a huge mechanism of insulin signal transduction when that polarity gets changed. And that's how, you know, sort of everything functions is there's a positive negative polarity change that either, uh, that changes the shape of a protein, which is involved with all that water that's supposed to be surrounding all these proteins, right? So there's a, there's an issue right there. Cause now you've changed the charge in the water. You've changed the charge of, um, the actual like things with ATP and all that stuff, right? You've changed all that complicated, mm. like crazy biochemistry that nobody wants to know. Um, just a battery, oh, just, yeah. <laughs> change the polarity of the battery. Yeah. Ain't gonna, yeah. So, so you change all that stuff, calcium gets kicked out and it goes places where it's not supposed to go. And like, so one of the, one of the easier mechanisms to understand is the um, mitochondrial permeability transport pore, right? This lets things in, keeps things out that aren't supposed to be there. So when that thing with what calcium does again, it changes that polarity and it keeps that pore from closing. And one of the things that the natural mechanisms for that thing to open and close are, are, are part of is like autophagy, apoptosis. Like when that thing's not working properly, it's not going to keep the things out that aren't supposed to be in there that can affect autophagy and apoptosis, for example, right? which we know are, are crucial to like cancer and some of these other things when those things aren't working properly. So that pore stays open. You get fluid changes, fluid displacement, right? One of this is one of the things that causes cell swelling. So you'll get cytosolic fluid where it's not supposed to be, which has a different charge than the matrix fluid. So again, now you're changing polarity, you're changing how all these things function. And all this starts with this non-native electromagnetic radiation, right? So now this pore is open, you get this change of fluid, and then you know, you, you harken back to like some of these other things. Uh, it's called Archimedes principle. So Archimedes principle, right? Like you've got a, a glass of water filled to the very top, you drop a golf ball in there, you're gonna lose the fluid uh, displaced by the same like size and weight of the golf ball, right? So when things swell, things have to get displaced, right? So if a mitochondria is swelling, like it's not supposed to, that's going to displace fluid, right? So the mitochondrial permeability transport pore causes swelling of the mitochondria. That thing gets bigger inside the fluid, you know, cell that it's in. Now you've got fluid that has to be displaced somewhere, which again, changes polarity and signaling again further. 
So now as that thing starts to swell, then your the mitochondria is getting farther apart from the nucleus. And we know, I mean, it's quite simple to think if something's close to something, it's going to be able to communicate easier and faster, right? So as that distance increases, especially when we're talking about charge changing and uh, information mm -hmm. flowing on protons and electrons, right? That that gets slower. If for every angstrom, something gets farther apart, which is like a bazillionth of a nanometer, it slows down mm -hmm. like tenfold, right? So if you if you move something one angstrom apart, you just slow down communication like exponentially. So mm -hmm. like these things start to swell, the fluid gets displaced, signaling gets off, the mitochondria tells the nucleus what to do. So might, we know now, like one of these things that, that we're learning from 20 years ago is that mitochondria actually controls genetic expression from the nucleus via reactive oxygen species, via all these sort of protein transports, all these crazy things. But the, all that starts in the mitochondria that then tells the nucleus to express this gene, express that gene in the absence of, of the circadian rhythms at that point, right? So, that, so you've got that. So that gets disrupted. Uh, mitonuclear coaptation changes as the mitochondria gets farther apart. That signal doesn't work as well. You start to get all these dysfunctions, build up reactive oxygen species, inflammation, this whole chain reaction of, of crazy complex stuff. And that's how you start to dehydrate the inside of the mitochondria where that's not working properly anymore. And one of the, mm -hmm. like one of the, the biggest issues with how variable non-native, the reaction to non-native EMF can be is right. Like you and I could be sitting in the presence of the exact same radiation and probably have two completely different reactions to it. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know why that reaction is different. I mean, there's could be a bazillion reasons with what's going on inside us as to why that that is, is happening that way. But like, there's no real good reason for uh, like electromagnetic hypersensitivity and, and all these other things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's what partially what makes it so unbelievable to really sort of get the thing of this, well, why isn't, you know, why my ancestors did fine for them. my mother and father are fine. All these people are fine. Like 90% of the world's fine, but everybody's not fine and it does cause some financial issues. Yeah. yeah. And we, we actually have everybody is not fine. <laughs> yeah. and, and there's actually a lot of really good research. It was just done in the Soviet Union in the 50s and the 60s. You know, and, and mm. it one you got to learn how to read it, but when you start to parse through it, like they did a ton of research and one of the things they found is that there's no way to predict what's going to happen. Like some people could have a fine reaction to it, some people could you know it could be like terminal um, and so if we start to look at the quantum physics aspect of this, ultimately at the like electron level, right, the, the radiation can either act as a wave or a particle. And so if you're completely unfamiliar with that concept, you think about it with like light versus sound, right? If I've got a solid wall and shine a flashlight at it, the person on the other side is probably not going to be able to see any of it, right? That's a particle. Mm -hmm. Particle has to cross the energy barrier different than sound does. But now if I, if I have a subwoofer or some non-directional type of sound or even just some loud sound and somebody's on the other side, they can hear that. They can perceive that sound sometimes quite clearly. So the non-native EMF stuff can make a what should be behaving like a wave, which is what light does essentially with like photosynthesis and how ele electrons actually behave in wave form for the most part. And it can change mm -hmm. that and make it behave more like a particle. And when it behaves more like a particle, it's more reactionary. It has sort of almost a different function or a different feature. And that that radiation can act, you know change how these things are acting. It can act as one versus the other. So if you have something that needs to be acting in a particle form and it becomes a wave, that could be a problem. Or if it needs to be acting in a wave form, like with photosynthesis and how things move through electron transport chain, right? Like it, one of the crazy thing that we know is with photosynthesis, an electron essentially takes every possible route and goes the fastest one. So that's the wave aspect of light affecting biochemistry, right? So if you disrupt that and turn that wave, I think it's called a soliton maybe, uh, and that becomes more of a particle action, then that one electron taking every possible route simultaneously can only take one route because now it's functioning as one entity and not a wave. And that can be quite disruptive to, to biochemistry, to biology, to everything sort of, you know, have, that's happening beneath all those levels. Mm. Well, hey, buddy. Um, first of all, we got a nugget of like some of our favorite words and terms. Yay. <laughs> um, you know, we love uh, learning and I'd say I love the word indulging because like, you know, I'm a I'm a student. First and foremost, last a teacher, you know, and I love the details. I love, uh, you know, being able to like sit there visually with the mitochondria and, um, and, you know, also electrons, right? Like how many, you know, that, cause that 
that's one of the things we work with here is the electricity of the body. And a lot of people don't realize that's what I'm doing for, or we're doing. And they, um, we have a hard time kind of sitting people down and saying like, lifestyle changes are absolutely needed for this technology to work. Um, we have some of the, I mean, I, we have some of the best stuff here to help people with pain, tightness, injuries, and like reversing joint conditions basically and muscle conditions. And when they, you know, when we have these we call them powwows, <laughs> consultations. When we powwow, we, um, we, we get some looks sometimes about these like really foundational lifestyle factors. What do you, you know? Yeah, it's, it can be very frustrating to see that there's a disconnection in people's minds. It, it requires a whole paradigm shift and, and like what you're saying, this quantum model, right? And so people don't think that sleep uh, or a light diet They're like oh what is that's a different thing than what we're doing here um is there a way in i mean and and you know mm -hmm. i love that the the passion that you speak about with this like you are fired up and we love it mm -hmm. and i got so much from that answer but is there like from from like a, a lay person's perspective or how do, is is there a bridge in that you found um effective for for people and getting them to understand um, oh gosh, I love this phrase that you said uh, in one talk that I heard. You said they're tripping over a hundred dollars to get coins, <laughs> and so like that's what we're trying to get them to the hundred dollars, right? Instead of like the, the chemical, what supplement should I take, or what what protein shake, or so. Um, I would love to hear some some of your hot takes on that. It, it's a very difficult hurdle to overcome uh, because you when you get down to like protons and electrons, right? Like you, for me, when I like, I, I struggle with teaching this to coaches because like, uh, well, don't tell me all that. Just tell me what I need to do to make it work. Like, well, if you don't understand all of this other stuff, you can't troubleshoot as many issues, right? If I tell you like what works, well, what happens when that doesn't? Because oftentimes it doesn't. Like it's very frequently, most of the stuff that's supposed to work doesn't. So I, I, I try my best to get people interested in learning down to that level. You don't need to be like, I, I can explain like first grade, maybe kindergarten level quantum physics compared to how ridiculously complex this stuff is. Right. So you don't need to be like, super smart. If I can understand it and get anybody to understand it. So it's like, I really struggle with not wanting people to get it at that level. Because to me, that's what was so interesting. Like, well, what's the actual difference outside of calories, outside of blood glucose, outside of all this other stuff? Like, what's the actual difference between a carb and a fat? Like, why, why does it matter, you know, if I have bananas at midnight in December? Or like, why does it why does it? Um, and so one of the things that I've, I've had success with with some coaches is, is sort of talking about it from the technological aspect, right? Like, you get, a, you get the iOS on the phone, and it doesn't matter if you've got a 14, a 15, whatever the new iPhone is. And if you're trying to run like iOS 6 or, you know, whatever they're called on the brand new phone, the brand new phone's going to run like trash. Like it's not going to do, you know, it's going to have a nice screen and a good camera, but it's going to function like garbage. And that's really what these kind of how these signals can equate, right? Because the, the light and the circadian rhythm and all that stuff, that's way more than just sleep wake controls the the ios and everything that's on the inside right and and supplements and all that other stuff are just like the apps that can do good stuff for how the phone functions hmm. so i i it's something i struggle with i don't have a great answer for you and it's something i struggle with getting my own clients to to buy into you know a lot of this stuff like i've got guys i've been training for 13 14 15 years now and when i try to talk to them about electrons they're just like i I'm going to go train. I think um, we analogy them until they red pilled. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the phone technology analogy has been my most successful one of late. I feel like that's something everyone can relate to, um, you know, because we've all experienced how bad your phone functions when it needs to be updated. Mm. And it's, you know, it's like if you're 
if you're not waking up, seeing the sun, seeing the sunrise, getting the different light signals, if you're eating a, the wrong foods at the wrong time of day, the wrong time of year, you are like going backwards on, on the iOS that you're trying to run on this wonderful physique that you're trying to build. You know, it's you're, you're building dysfunction into the system. And it's, that's one of those things where, you know, like you, we have to understand how deep the control is on this stuff. You know I mean? Like the, the most important uh, pathway in biochemistry is probably the TCA cycle. And those TCA cycles made up of enzymes and proteins that are all controlled by circadian rhythms, right? So it's, like, it's not the only one. They all are. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, th I think, I guess if I was going to narrow it down to one, the whole iOS thing and the, the $100 bills to, to pick up nickels. Those are, those have been my most successful too. It, it's a very yeah. hurdle to overcome because I do actually work with people and try to get them to understand this stuff. Um, yeah. So one of the ways in for us has been temperature checking with, you know, I mean, we just, it's, I think the simple, the simplest explanation has been, do you, you know, do you have a way to temp track your temperature that's reliable? And if it's below this mark, I, you know, the ability for you to get stronger and have less pain is not available to you. And I, you know, that, I, that, that digs the, the hole for the rabbit, you know, don't you? Most of the time they take their temp and it's low 97. So it's like ding, 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 you know, there's <laughs> certain, um, yeah, ways in, I guess that. We're experimenting with we're yeah Definitely. we're experimenting with that one um yeah and it's uh it's fun to like i don't know like accelerate like when somebody comes in they're like oh my temperature was you know it closer in, in the 98s and i don't know we have fun with it too like you know we uh, we we make it like a radio station like 98.9 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um and I don't, speaking of temperature, I want to ask about um, women's hor uh, and their cycle throughout the month. There's a, I think this, this, I, there's women, female coaches out there promoting the idea that training a certain way each week is a good way to honor your hormones. Do you know what I'm talking about? I've I've heard this and it's a yeah. sounds like a really good concept. Yes. Um except like we had we actually talked had someone on the podcast um well we recorded a conversation last week and she mentioned, you know, yoga this week, hit this week and it just made me realize like one of my basic frustrations with the optimal health optimal performance, you know, place that we exist. Um, we both know that that is a hard place to get to is optimal health, optimal performance. It, even if that performance is, you know, picking up your kids without pain or like, you know, Amber, a professional athlete that comes in here who does mind her circadian rhythm and kind of wish she was here for this. She's such a beast. And um, one of the, that, that basic foundational frustration is the optimal health internet people are, they just like disregard like how strength training can be such a huge component of optimizing like our energy systems. And so I don't really have anything to say except like I'm, it pisses me off mm -hmm. and like, you know, do we really have to, as females who don't want to like, you know, overdrive our hormones, can I strength train every, do my strength training every week and have a good cycle and be hormonally sound, functional, healthy? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of this stuff I think is, say people create problems so they can sell you solutions, right? And it's not that people are inventing that, oh, this would probably be good this week and that would be good next week. And it's, and, and I've heard the same things with diet, which are like, oh, that's fantastic. Like, I, I really like that. We're going to do keto this week and eat all your carbs this week and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like, all right, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But in it, like, okay, well, are we, 
are we actually trying to get better at the weightlifting? Are we trying to get better at the yoga? And if you only do those for a few days in a row out of each month, you're not going to improve at the rate you can improve. So you got that, right? There's specific, uh, what is it said principle? So you got adaptation to implied demand. The less frequently you do it, it's like learning a foreign language. If you practice Chinese the first week of every month and don't practice it again for three weeks, it'll be really hard to get good at speaking Chinese. Right. So, and then when you look at the data on, on strength and actual performance around the different phases of the cycle, it actually doesn't change. And, hmm. and these aren't, you know, Olympians that they're studying and it's not clean and jerks and power snatches that these, that they're testing. It's like basic neurological, really good markers that we use a lot for other things like grip strength. And I forget what some of the other ones were, right. But it, like the markers don't change. So hmm. a lot of people think they're like so special that they have to do all this other stuff. And the simplest way that you can do this is like, if you feel great, go train train hard, train your ass off. If you show up and you train like trash the first few minutes, leave. Like it, it's very simple. And that like, that's how I do it across the board. I've trained female bodybuilders and bikini competitors, and I've had females in the Olympics and I've had 70 year old, you know, females that don't do anything other than want to move. Right. And it's no different for any of them. Like if we're having a great day, I don't care what day you're on of your cycle. If you're coming in and you can train like a rock star, then we're going to train. And if you're yes. on a different day of the month and it's, you know, you had a fight with your spouse or whatever, and you didn't sleep and you feel like crap, well, we're going to do something <laughs> way easier or you're just going to go home and live to fight another day. And if you abide by that, it's a bulletproof recipe for success. Train hard when you can, don't train when you can't. And like, there's, so there's one thing with, with the exercise science in the, in the States. And I don't really know why this happens here versus like the old Eastern block stuff. And this, you know, some of the, the stuff that Charles brought to the States mm -hmm. is so the concept of deloading in, in Western exercise science is you do a, you know, you do a full workout, you do your normal amounts of exercises, but you just don't train very hard. So you're training like 50%, 60%, like not explosive, not fast. You're just basically, it's a wasted, useless workout for one to a few days. Mm -hmm. Whereas what the other, like some of the communist countries would do and get much better results from is when you're going to deload, you train hard, you just don't train as much. So normally you're doing six sets. Now you're going to do two, right? Because it's not, mm -hmm. it's the six sets that are driving you into the ground for recovery, right? Like everybody has a threshold of how many really hard sets they could do on a good day or a bad day and get mm -hmm. improvement. But you know, one of, the, one of the things we look at is, all right, you did a hundred pounds for five reps last week. We should be doing four to 8% more this week. And you come in and you can't do a hundred pounds for five reps on set one. All right, let's just try one more and see if it was just a bad set. You need to get the motor started and you, and you fail again. All right. We're no longer getting better. So we're not, this is not productive anymore. So we're either going to do something that requires no central nervous system, you know, horsepower, like calves and abs and grip work, right. Stuff that, that you can go really hard on and not feel like crap, or you're just going to go home and rest and come back. And every time when somebody gets kicked out and comes back, when they come back, they have the best performance that they've had in, you know, for that program, right? It, it, it happens every time. So, you know, you can come up with all this fancy stuff, but like everybody mm -hmm. might be a little bit different, you know, like obviously the things move with the moon and everybody's like, you can sync up when you're hanging out in the room and all that stuff, but everybody's going to be a little bit different, right? Like your, your neurotransmitters aren't going to be the same as the person next to you, no matter what's going on with your cycle and your cycle can affect those neurotransmitters differently. I mean, so what you ate, what they ate versus the light and the, all these, all these things. So if you can train hard, do it, get the results when they're there and then just back off when they're not. And then you don't have mm -hmm. to worry about all these crazy, fancy, you know, protocols. Like is the performance there or not? Mm -hmm. bottom line? And if it's not go home, you're not, you're not being productive. Yeah. Well, I feel pretty little validated there. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. Cause it was, um, I have another show where <laughs> 
uh, my co-host Meredith and I go in on these like trends, basically. We spend an hour talking with no objective except to, you know, look at memes and get frustrated about fitness, of course, like about fitness. And um, we've been contemplating going in in the direction of this, like, you know, follow your hormone cycle to schedule your workouts. And, you know, she's a former bikini pro, you know, I, I'm a former competitive athlete. I've coached so many competitive athletes. And of course, we're not going to have anything, you know, supportive to say about this like trend. Right. Um, so anyways, <laughs> um, we had some pretty good questions when I pulled Instagram yesterday. I do want to get to those um, that are on topic, which is great. Angela, do you have anything before? I just want to really acknowledge what you said about dealing with what appears on that day-to-day basis. Like, despite what maybe your whoop strap says or your aura ring, like, how do I feel? Can I perform? And then adjust accordingly. It's not fruitful there's diminished returns if people push through you know this is a big paradigm shift also it's not about just destroying yourself in the name of gains the opposite oftentimes is true so i just want to acknowledge um, what you're saying and, and really hope the people listening get that point of it's not about that it's about honoring how you show up in that moment and going back to that first thing what you said we don't know how that non-native radiation affected you did, like you said did you have a fight with your spouse how did you sleep are you hydrated like all of these things um, we've got to account for and just to maximize like what is what are you looking for what is your outcome you know and and to really focus back in on that so and it can be a fine line between getting really neurotic like uh, with these things which creates the exact problem what you're trying to overcome versus like getting the data and adjusting accordingly and moving in a balanced fashion so that you can realize both the outcomes that you're looking for and have a beautiful life experience and so um, i just want to thank you for for that piece as someone who knows all the science you're giving us permission to say hey it's not there today like go home take a nap maybe if you can come back tomorrow you're going to crush it watch like test it out and see sorry i got got real excited about that because it's about like testing it out what works and i think that's where maybe another end we could really get with people Mm -hmm. like what's working because clearly it's not that yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's what that was my rant. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, not barely rant. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But didn't you say like Simone Biles yesterday had like another outrageous performance? And then she was like, I just took some time off. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it works for the best of the best. Like, there's no reason yeah. it's going to work for, you know, a 48 year old mom of three. Like, it's going to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You're gonna rest>. mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, man, yeah, the amount of uh, the priority I've put on resting in the past, like, four years has definitely paid off, like, um, yeah, but I mean, I still love my workouts, so it's not, you know, (laughs) I haven't, I I haven't lost any, you know, yeah, no, so anyways, um, so yeah, let's get into some of these. So some of the questions that came in were really good. Um, and it, I heard you say something, um, I don't know when it was, but it was very exciting to me because most people know I love a cold immersion and you had said something about cryotherapy damaging skin receptors. Yeah. Um, can you refresh? Can I hit refresh on that? Yeah. Cause I was very excited to read it and then I totally forgot. So, all right. So there's no peer reviewed research on this. This is just very anecdotal, but it happens a lot. And mm-hmm. with the people who have tracked it, what they have found is an appreciable decrease in the amount of uh, 25 D that you can synthesize when you're doing cryotherapy. It goes, mm-hmm. yeah, so it goes down. Now I, can't really probably couldn't tell you why other than the fact that it's doing something to what your skin can do to transduce light could be doing something with the blood underneath the skin that is causing an issue i don't really know i don't i can't explain it but that has happened enough times and i've heard that enough uh in addition to cryo just being extremely inefficient uh (laughs) you know enough to be like well that you shouldn't do that now what i have read really good research on is that 
cryo in the when you when you're doing red light therapy or, or photobiomodulation with infrared cryo decreases the results of what would normally happen when you haven't done cryo whether you do cryo before or after you train whether you do cryo before or after you use infrared light you do not get the same improvements when you do cryotherapy at the same time specifically cryo not uh cold immersion uh, mm -hmm. with the with the red light so there is definitely something that happens with cold like extremely cold air versus moderately cold water mm. that's um that's funny because people ask, like because they see me doing my cold stuff and they're like so what do you think of cryo and i'm like i, I think it's a waste of time i think it's garbage and it's mostly because it, it doesn't like uh, resonate with one of my basic philosophies of taking care of myself, which is it's just such a shock to the system, you know, not in the good way that 55 degree water is. <laughs> right. Which is pretty cold, but it's not like, 30, yeah. right. And one yeah. of the interesting things that I found looking into cold water immersion is that the water pressure in most cases can have a bigger impact on the effect of water immersion than the temperature of the water. The temperature of the water yeah. can have a very specific impact uh, on the brain and on the circadian system in particular, but as far as what's going on just underneath the surface of what is being submerged, it is the pressure mm -hmm. of the water that actually has a substantial impact on the physiology mm -hmm. uh, going on underneath it with how it moves blood around, uh, so even in the presence of like 70 to 80 degree water, there are mm. very similar, like a lot of the same things happen, right? Whereas with cold, you're getting, uh, norepinephrine, you're getting all those things like the, the changes in the brain within PY and VIP and all, all, all that stuff that can make you cold adapted. But in terms of recovery, 70 to 80 degree water is productive for muscular recovery and just recovery in general, whereas like 50 degree water, say post-workout, uh, obviously not productive, right? Because it shuts off inflammation and, and a whole host of other things outside of the benefits of adrenaline and dopamine and, you know, all the stuff that people want to make cool. But it's mm -hmm. that water pressure um, that actually has a substantial impact on the benefits of, of immersion. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, well, hearing that... Um resonates because I've you know felt the difference in a natural pool of water versus a disgusting plastic tub um and I've done I've done like the 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 really high-end Mercedes you know 25k version of a nice uh the blue cube and it has you know moving water and that's different than you know plunging naturally just you know 20 minutes down the road here in Virginia also I know of a place in West Virginia that has supposedly like it's a, a, a blackout zone for EMFs. I know. Um, I'm going to call that guy. I'm WhatsApping him soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> take me to your land. <laughs> you know, what I got from that is just also just honoring the intelligence of the technology of the body. Like it can tell it detects the difference between a cold shower, a face plunge, immersion like there's just an intelligence that i think mm. we can all you know remind ourselves that we have this like dominion over that we can't there are certain inputs that we can control and then just leave it to do what it's designed to do which is to survive which is to be strong and so um that was what i got from from what you just said it's like it's amazing like you don't have to control like there's a there's this huge intelligence and technology that we're all sitting on and like can we mm -hmm. take what is, what is the word i'm looking for um like loving care and and charge over this uh, sovereignty in a way that uh, gets us what we think we want mm. oh man um yeah i i yeah, you said that perfectly. Like the the thing that like keeps coming back for me in this like whole season is the, you know, honoring the complexity, you know, like, and I mean, and having that like as a decision model for what you're spending your money on, who you're spending your time with, how you're exercising, um, 
Yeah, because uh, you know the more the more uh, of our you know client population, our listener population becomes that student of complexity. You know, the the more they're gonna you know just fall in love with this process and be vibrant health enthusiasts. And knowledge is power, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. There's um, another one. Um, there's the the app that I've been hearing a bunch about, which for vitamin D. Yeah. For oh, D Minder. Is that, yeah. Um, so what is, I could think, you know, like they ask a pretty specific question about their vitamin D production, but how does that, in, how would D Minder, an app like that, enhance our health and wellness? And uh, and uh, and all that. I'm such a big fan of this. So it's a great, uh, great question for the technology aspect, right? Um, all right. So I have uh, ginger tendencies and, uh, and Irish mm -hmm. and like French mm -hmm. backgrounds, right? Uh, and prior to D Minder, I would never have a tan, would never be able to get one because I'd either, you know, use sunscreen or whatever. I just burn, get roasted, wouldn't really sweat. It was a train wreck. So I hated being outside. Yeah, me too. I'm in that cat. Yeah, I, I had trouble sweating for a while and I didn't even realize it was an issue. I just turned into a tomato. Yeah, it sucks. It really sucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so knowing all that, right, like I'm a very naturally pale individual and have with by using D-Minder have been able to, I mean, like 10x my, my outdoor time at, at least. I have yet to be sunburned even like at the beach on vacation out in the sun a lot compared to what I used to like just used to would go to the beach on vacation, just not go to the actual beach. I would just, oh, that's oh. Sad. yeah, it, it was a miserable existence. Um, but because of things like D minder, it's great. Like I, no burn, no sunscreen, nothing. So what the app can do for you is, is, so you have uh, it's called a Fitzpatrick skin type, right? It's, basically your skin tone naturally uh some of the questions to help you identify do you burn easily uh do you burn but never tan do you tan super easily some of those questions will help you identify what your skin type is and based on that skin type we know what a essentially what a minimal uh erythral dose of ultraviolet radiation right enough to induce a color change that slight pinkness or or basically how much it takes for you to get burned and what the app can tell you to do or what the app can help you figure out is how long you can be outside based on um, if you tell it it's overcast or because uh, it'll GPS your location and find this specific of the sun. It'll give you the UV index, you know, the angle. You'll be able to approximate how much um, 25D that you can make based on where the sun is, how much skin you have exposed. But then it'll also tell you, hey, you've got 10 minutes on each side right now. Like <laughs> after that, either cover up or, you know, go, go away. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's been epic. It's, it's so, so, so good. Cause then, you know, like, all right, it's, you know, 10 AM, I got 45 minutes on each side. So if I'm just out for a walk, it means I can probably, you know, play tennis or something for 90 minutes shirtless and not come out of this with a sunburn. Or, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm going to play tennis or whatever, with my buddies at one in the afternoon, like, all right, bro, you got 10 minutes each side. So I'll have the shirt off for 20 minutes. And then after that, we're going to put on some sleeves and a cap. Uh, so I don't have to, you know, sunscreen up or whatever. So practically speaking, outside of, uh, of it helping you guesstimate what your 25 blood level, 25 D blood levels should be, or probably will be. Uh, so the tricky part with that is if you don't put it in all the time, right? Like every time you go outside, like mine right now is, is going to tell me my levels at like 36 because I don't do it every time I go outside. I'll do it when I'm going to be out for a while. Like if I'm going to the pool on the weekend, just so I know when I need to flip to not, you know, bake uh, and, and to know when to leave or go under the umbrella, you know? Um, and mine, uh, the app was telling me, I think 32. And at that time, like I did blood work and it was like 70 something, 67. Right. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, it will be accurate if you do it every time. But again, like that's, I, I don't care so much about that uh, as how useful it is to help me figure out when I'm going to get, you know, torched in the sun, uh, which, you know, like with everything else, right? Like that's where the, the big problem is, you know, vitamin C is great. Magnesium is great. But if you take too much, you're going to have a bad reaction. 
Uh, mm. So it's the same thing with the sun. Like the sun's phenomenal. Or you put a tarp over a plant outside, it's not going to grow. It's going to die and wither away. So it's the same thing with us. But if you over irradiate your lawn, right? Like my grass is turning a little brown right now because it's been 100 degrees for the last three months. Um, and we haven't had a ton of rain. So it's the same sort of thing. It's the, the dose makes the poison and the app can, can help you identify what the poison dose is so that you don't have to be afraid to be outside. You can be outside without toxic sunscreens on, uh, and, and you can like figure out your environment. Like, Oh, this is great. Like I can be out here for 20 minutes and then I'm going to go hit the thing uh, in the, in the umbrella for an hour and then I'll pop back out, you know? So uh, I recommend that for everybody. Uh, for every mm. and it if you can do it every time you go outside for mm -hmm. five days that can tell you like all right i'm i'm only getting outside enough to make 20 nanograms of 25d like, that sucks it's july that should be higher right uh mm -hmm. so you know it's like like tracking your food like you get somebody to track a new client or whatever tracks their food for three days or a week you got a pretty good idea of what their overall lifestyle is like if they're honest with stuff you know and it's the same thing with that. If I track this for three, four, five days and it's my normal routine and it's not like a beach vacation, you'll get a great idea or indicator of how little you're outside and what your blood levels probably are and how much we need to change your your outside behavior and your, and your lifestyle, not just taking a pill, but change your lifestyle so that you can actually take advantage of the benefits of the sunlight and not be so uh, photonically deficient. <laughs> what yeah so you posted yesterday that vitamin d is made in in the skin yes that's that's the that's the uh the embryo and the you know that's where it's distributed from and so what's happening when when people are dosing like forty thousand units or whatever those once a week pills are that our gps not mine um <laughs> with gps uh hand out to clients or patients that have low D. So this is probably one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, okay. so what we need to know, which most people really don't understand is that there are, I mean, there's way more than two vitamin Ds. There's like 20 at least that we know of that all. Have oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> when you take a supplement, you're taking one form that has no biological activity, zero. The only thing that molecule can do inside your body is occupy the VDR receptor and not do anything when it gets there. Okay. So, yep. so let's it's start with that. Thyroid hormones. Yeah. You're, you're taking a ton of useless substrate where it's mm -hmm. really complex, right? So you, you have, so I say 25D instead of vitamin D to try to be more uh, indicative of this. So the, what you typically measure when you are just picking vitamin D to measure it in the lab is 25D in the blood, which is the inactive. People call it a storage molecule. It's not really a storage molecule um, because it's everywhere, but it's also, it's inactive in the blood. And 25D is the raw material for the active form, 125. So the relationship here is that almost always when 25D is found low in the blood, 125D is exceptionally high the active molecule. So what people have mistaken and, and what 99.8% of the research does is equates 25 D in the blood with biological activity. And, and that's just flat out false. It doesn't do anything, nothing. So let's be very clear. When you check that you are checking a useless molecule. Mm. So when you take it, what you, what you could potentially be doing, and this is where it can get like a, it could be a big problem, right? So, so you measure your blood and let's say your, your, your vitamin D 25 is like 20. It's like, oh God, that's terribly low. But at the same time, the active molecule, which you don't check because no one ever does, let's say that's dangerously high, which is why you feel like crap when your 25 D is low, right? Because 125, the active molecule is the one that does all the work. That is your immune response. So one of the things we know, uh, and it's really cool to read the research on this, and I heard this years ago, is that you can take a boatload of D3 supplement after you've been out in the sun and not feel sunburnt. Like you could look sunburnt, you could be out in a, in a like a, a sunburn dose, take 25D, and what that does is it turns off the immune response 
that is like the adaptation or the pain that the sunburn causes, right? It turns it off. So that means you just negated all the sun exposure you just got. Now you don't feel pain, mm. but you're not getting the benefits of the sun exposure you got. And the same thing happens with uh, sickness. So, so colds, for example, one of the, one of the tricks that we've known for a mm-hmm. time is you take, um, geez, I think it's a hundred, like a hundred IUs. Yeah. Maybe like a hundred IUs, something like that for every uh, kilogram of body weight. No, sorry. A thousand IUs. Cause I took a hundred thousand IUs, something like that. This is right. And, and what happens? You feel better. You stop feeling sick. Why would you stop feeling sick? Because you just turn the, that 25 D molecule occupies the VDR. So the immune system can't fight off the cold or can't fight off the infection. So you feel much better mm-hmm. because you don't feel like crap because you're fighting off cold or an infection or a disease or whatever it is. So there's this really <laughs> sticky situation there where like if you're not checking both of those you could be doing a substantial amount of harm because there is a proper ratio that we know what those should be in and that should change throughout the year based on sun exposure and and like what the weather is like right but the really interesting thing is there's a few things with 125 the 125 d level has no seasonal variation so that's interesting Now, the other thing is when you turn off the genes that help make the conversions in the uh, in the kidney from 25 to the active form 125, the levels of 125 within an individual cell don't really change. So what that means is that the cell has the ability to make and synthesize its own 125 D without the cascade that we've been taught of 25 to the liver, to the kidney, to, to this or that. So, so there's a very complex web here of everyone and, and it's, and the research does this, like I've combed through, I've had like tons of arguments with Dr. Serrano about this. And fortunately he's told me I'm right. So I, I convinced him, but he's told me like, all right, I believe you. That's that's right. Um, mm-hmm. but what, what his response is when I give them 25 D they feel better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get it. Do I want them to feel better or do I want them to get better? Because there's, yeah. there's a substantial difference there. Like, so with 125, what we learned from all the autoimmunity research is that that 125 molecule, the active form, has a higher affinity for thyroid receptors, for glucocorticoid receptors, for androgen receptors, it's like basically for everything. So when that level, right, so if you're low and that's already high and you're putting in more of the substrate to make more, Mm-hmm. There's no auto regulatory mechanism that says we've got enough 125. We're not going to make any more when it comes in via supplement. Mm-hmm. But irradiation, uh, which is one of, what, one of the things I was talking about in that post, this is where those like 20 other forms of D3 come into play because when 25D is created in the skin and then in the blood, the longer that molecule is irradiated in the sunlight, the more it changes forms. It'll change from tachysterol to lumisterol and all these other like sterol CYP11A1 pathway metabolites that stay in the blood that then get like back converted to 25D when the body senses that it's not high enough to facilitate whatever it needs to be used for, which would in theory be the conversion to 125. And so when you take a ton of 25, what ends up happening or what can end up happening, which is why you just need to check both, right, is that that 25 D can occupy the 125 receptor. Now it's not going to occupy the thyroid receptor or the androgen receptor or the glucocortical receptor. So if I've already got an excess amount of that 125 molecule and I start to put in tons of 25 and it's, so it's either going to make more or the body's going to say, nope, then that 25 D is going to start occupying the 125 receptor. 125 then has no choice, but to occupy all the other receptors it has higher affinity for. And when you start to autoimmune disease, these are the presentations, right? Why would the body yeah. attack thyroid? Why would it attack these other molecules if it doesn't, if it's not being told, well, there's something already in that site. This is a foreign entity. Go get it. Take it out. It's not supposed to be there. And that's the relationship we start to see when 125 is in excess. So the simple solution is to just check them both, right? If you're not checking both. And, and so this is where like all the research is so just frustrating because the vast majority of, of the actual outcomes of a low 20, of a low 25 D blood level above 21 really doesn't show much health benefit. 
but mm -hmm. you don't, it doesn't need to be 60, 70, 80, right? Now you're talking to a sun worshiper here. So mm -hmm. what I've sort of started to figure out and wrap my head around how all these things go together is that if I'm, if my natural level is 60, 70, 80, or even higher, and it's only coming from the sun, then there's going to be no, like, there's going to be no detriment, right? I'm not going to have that abundance of 125 occupying the receptors because the, there is a shutoff mechanism. When it comes from the sunlight created in the blood, your body will not make more 25D than it actually needs to do what it's supposed to do because it just gets irradiated and backfilled and you can just like liberate it, right? Mm -hmm. You can use it how it's supposed to be used. Or um, but one of the things people forget is like when, when, when you eat salmon, you know there's vitamin D in salmon, right? So it's not just found in the blood, 25D. You can store it everywhere. It's stored in fat tissue. It's stored in muscle tissue. It's probably stored in organs, right? It's stored everywhere, mm -hmm. not just found in the blood. So when you start to look at that, you have to start to put these pieces together, like uh, check them both, and then you can start to see, because there's things you can do um, to, to dissociate 125 from, from the VDR. Uh, or uh, from receptor sites it's not supposed to be in. Mm -hmm. Liberate that, you allow the immune system to then actually do what it's supposed to be doing to fight these conditions or these infections or, or whatever it is. And, and one of the things that, that people have started to track long-term are things like um, EBV and there's there's a few of these like weird viruses mm -hmm. that occupy the VDR. Right, which is another reason why 125 is extremely elevated in the presence of some of these infections, and why 25D would also be low in the presence of some of these infections. Right, because 125 is not bound to the receptor. Uh, so, like, if you're if that's you and you you got a low 25D and you start taking boatloads of supplements, like, what's going to happen in 10 to 15 years from now? Because we really don't know that. Right. Nobody was pushing 50,000 IUs of D3 in the 90s and the 80s and the potentially the early 2000s. Like I've got the paper somewhere. I was just reading it uh, this morning. I forget when it came out, but they changed the levels of all that stuff. Right. Like they changed what the minimum threshold would be. And it's not that there's like this weird cabal to, you know, kill people with, vitamin D, but still it's like, it's just not right. Like the, yeah. there's one side of the story that's always told in the research with all this, mm -hmm. this other side that's just not not brought into the equation. Oh. Are you okay, Angela? No. no. <laughs> uh, I, if I needed another oh reason. <laughs> wow. Just thank you for explaining that so beautifully and for your research and for digging, because I know you had to dig for that. It just, I started to get emotional because people are playing with fire, like literally. And it's like in the name of good health. And literally it's heartbreaking. I'm sorry to see people put good after bad. And like the body clearly runs on physics and in a quantum way, not on chemistry. And we, we got to stop thinking we know better. I mean, it's just, gosh, I'm just so grateful. The world can hear this. Like it's really, it's really special. And another point I would love to highlight that you said is just because there's a difference and people conflate it between feeling better and being better. And we got to get really clear <laughs> on healing sometimes looks like pain or swelling or redness or these things. This is the body's technology coming in. If we override that mm -hmm. with what, you, I mean, I'm, I'm just, my mind is blown. I'm so grateful for this conversation and gosh, thank you. That's really, I'm, I'm not okay. I'm like, I'm full of all the things, but I'm going to remain quiet for a few minutes so I can process the, the, the profound nature of what you just said and really let it land in me and let it land in all, all everybody that's potentially listening. It's really huge. Hmm. That's a, to relate that, like what I'm, t what I'm trying to talk about there with why does it, why do you feel, cause people will feel better, right? Do you, when I took 50,000 IUs a day or, a uh, uh, Two or three times a week, like I felt like a rock star. When I'm sick, mm -hmm. I felt like a rock star. So everybody's like, "Well, why? Why do I feel so good?" But we have all these other practical examples that we now know of why that happens. Really, right? like if you uh, you roll your ankle, you put ice on it, it stops hurting. But we also know that that slows down the healing process, right? Because it's turning off the immune system, which is what 25D does when you take that. If you're elevating 125. Uh, same sort of thing with NSAIDs, right? I've got horrible back issues, and NSAIDs allow me to do things that I 
wouldn't normally be able to recover from. I know they're terrible, but they give me instant relief and I love playing ping pong. So I want to go play te uh, tennis and ping pong with my buddies. So I'm going to take a shitload of NSAIDs so I don't have to lay there and twitch in agony for, you know, the rest of the day. Like nothing I can do about it. natural shit's just not working. Right. So there's reasons for that kind of stuff. And I think if we if we explain it that way, um, that tends to make it make more sense. Like, yes, you feel better when you take this, but that isn't necessarily a great thing in the short term. OK, maybe. But in the long term, we, we just don't know. The studies that we do have long term show that elevated levels of 25 only not looking at both, but only 25 don't actually change longevity outcomes. So there's there's a lot with that. And one of the other things I just thought about is if you if you look at the COVID and some of that stuff, right? I don't want to talk about that very much, but hmm. the, the 25D molecule is a is what's called an acute phase reactor, or, or sorry, it's a negative acute phase reactant. And this is one of the things that I've changed from my from all my polyquin stuff is, you know, one of the things that we had with biosignature and that we try to teach is like the foundation five or like your your foundational supplements, right? And, yeah. you know, D3 was a huge part of that. Yeah. But what we know yeah. now looking at this, these combinations of things is that 25D in the blood is usually low as a response to a problem, not a lack of something, right? Usually, hmm. usually. So when you start looking at it that way, well, why is that low? What's going on to like, are, are you just storing tons of 25D in your body fat because you're overweight? Yeah, could be. So, well, shit, don't take it because we get you leaner. You're going to have more in your blood. So that problem solved. Or is it low and 125 super high because you're fighting off some sort of infection? Well, if that's the case, taking 25D may raise the blood level, but it's not going to do anything to address the problem. So it taking taking that off the table as a supplement and, and as a everybody needs this because everybody's low. Like, well, this is not like magnesium mm -hmm. where you're just either not eating enough or, you know, you can take more and it solves all your problems. Like this is low in response to a to a problem mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. if you're going to take anything away from this mm -hmm. topic of conversation. If you see low 25D on your labs, it yes, we're not getting sun exposure. so it could be that or it could be low in response to an issue right so there's several things there it's not just low because you need to take more of it mm -hmm. yeah yeah period and, and it yeah. could be worse than doing nothing because you could be actually causing harm because you're shutting down the immune response that's the initial problem and so now these autoimmune problems develop. And so one of the things we'd like for our listeners to do is really be able to make associations appropriately. And that can be hard because there's a lag time often. And then there's that confusing factor of feeling better. Right. So, um, yeah, interesting. Hmm. Well, gather yourself. Okay. We have one last question. <laughs> okay. You know, it's pretty fun. Um, What's your favorite snack? Oh, geez. Uh, healthy or non-healthy? Either, both. Well, I guess funnel cake wouldn't necessarily constitute a snack, would it? Uh, no, yeah, I don't know. Like, so, like it's in your cabinet. Like, yeah, you like, or you you reach for it at the store because you you know. Talenti Mediterranean mint gelato. Ooh, mint gelato. I don't think I've had that. I like, I like, I like the citrus flavors hmm. that, that mint is really good <sighs> yeah well i'm glad to say we keep snacks here so we can have our carbs during the day you know <laughs> just leave it at that <laughs> we love gelato and ice cream we do yeah okay. we made um we had a little powwow of our own and made some butter pecan with raw milk and oh, it was so delightful yeah it was, bad yeah, it was pretty yeah yeah um, it was like the KitchenAid thing. You know, you get it. You're like, we're never going to use this. It's the second time it's been used. And we looked through a couple different like ice cream. I don't know if you call them cookbooks, recipe books. And uh, found out that Jenny's uses, what was it, cream cheese? Cream cheese and corn syrup. Yeah. So, yeah, not cute. Anyways, yeah. Um, that, yeah, that is our last question. Um, so... Rob, where can people find you? Or if you don't want to be found, that's cool. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Instagram is Robert C. Jacobs. That's where most of the, like, the content is. And uh, website is outlawstrength.com. So if you want to look at signing up for training or 
really that's pretty much on all the contents on Instagram. So if you want to learn stuff, go to the Instagram. If you want to actually work with me, then you can do consults and uh, purchase program training programs and stuff on, on the website. Yeah. And you, you also work with, uh, trainer education as well, correct? Yes. Yeah. So outlaw strength is primarily like, uh, I mean, it's, it's my umbrella for, for continuing education for coaches. That's, uh, that's what I do half the, so half the day, basically training the other half, uh, educating. Cool. Um, well, listeners, uh, thank you so much for just being open to questioning, um, getting deeper, getting complex or actually being complex and honoring it. <laughs> You're already complex. Um, and you know, you know where to find us. Think fit, be fit, uh, underscore podcast on Instagram, the web, we have a newsletter. You all probably all know this, but it's just um, so good to have season six. I've been doing this since 2018 and people are going to listen all over the world where there's an abundance of sunshine and uh, maybe a lack of because this will go live in, uh, you know, early fall. So thank you or early fall here. Anyways, thank you so much. Um, I have just an enormous amount of respect for your platform and just really enjoy the education piece. And, um, you know, let's let, thanks for partying with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's thank great. you so much for listening and being a part of the Think Fit, Be Fit podcast network. Don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and family. If you're interested in further resources, check out or visit our website, thinkfitbefitpodcast.com.